This is our last Sunday of the month, of the year, of a week. Wait, last Sunday of the week, the first Sunday of this week. Last Sunday of this, 2023, December. And we are preparing to close up as 2023 and prepare for the new year, prepare for next Monday, the first Monday, the first Sunday of the month, which is communion. And at the same time, we are closing up the book of Acts chapter 16. So, prepare, if you, you have the access to go to the drive, you have the sermon notes in there. If not, just follow along. A passage is the last portion of the book of Acts, chapter 16. At the same time, we do not ignore the fresh green celebrated <clears throat> Christmas season and also the New Year's celebration either. We incorporate all of that, God's willing. <clears throat> but above all, as I always mention, that we should look for God in the page of the scripture, especially our Lord Jesus Christ. So that our life application will be fulfilled, blessed accordingly. So turn to our text today, Acts chapter 16, 35 to 40. Let me read this for you in this five, six verses. This is the incident after Paul and Silas were falsely accused and mistreated, beaten, and locked, locked up in the prison, and the Lord rescued them, and they gave the gospel, the jailer became a believer, and then they had a celebration, like we had Thanksgiving and Christmas as well, and I'm sure there was a baptism and communion, but the next word, verse, 35 on, there's a different scene, in 35 to 40 as followed. <laughs> but the contrast from what just ha happened, which ended in verse 34. <laughs> but when it was day, so it was night, the celebration, but now daytime come. And I'm sure you all know that the words have not for sure traveled to the magistrates yet. But the earthquake and all that commotion in that town did shook up that town. And at the same time, fears strike every soul, not just from the physical phenomena, but also the spiritual one. The magistrate said, sent the police saying, let those men go, let them go. And the jailer reported this words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. This is from a brother in Christ to another, but a different cultural world and position and situation. Feel sorry for him. The jailer had to walk those paths, both world, had to do his job. I'm sure it's very uncomfortable, but that's what it is. And at the same time, it's a release in his spirit, in his mind, to let his brother Paul and Silas go in peace. 37 is our main concern that you all have been asking for months. Today, we get the answer, God's willing. So we will focus on 37 and 40 the most, but I cover everything as well. 37, our interest verses here, 37 and 40, but 37 first, but Paul, but Paul. See, 35, start, but when it worse, they, and the jailer, and the magistrate said this, the jailer said that, but Paul said to them, them refer to all of them, 
that work under this magistrate, work under this governor, government setting here, said to them, they refer to the magistrate. They have beaten us public, publicly, uncondemned, unfair, no trial, just beat. The daylight out of us. Who are we, the uncondemned, the innocent? We are men who are Roman citizens. We are Roman citizens. That's a, that's a big problem. In a Roman culture, Roman empire, you do not mess with Roman citizen, especially, especially without a trial. Humiliate, unfair, unjust, all of that. And have thrown us, have thrown us, not had, but have thrown us, because we're still here, into prison, not to mention, shackles down deep in the bottom pit of the prison, the lowest level. And do they now, do they now, and do they now throw us out secretly? They throw us in publicly, they humiliate, they beat us, but now, throw us out secretly, be out of town in the back door, in the alley, just go, you know, here's some Capri Sun, and just go, you know, some juice here. I'm sure all of us, or most of us, at least wonder what's going on here. I understand this, but what's going on that the Apostle Paul, the most loving patient, the gospel barrier, Seems like he complained, seems like he wanted to get even, get right. Seems like he didn't sound like Paul, and sound like Christian. But another group says it sounds like very much Christian, I know. Yeah, that's not Christian. But the Bible has an answer in here clearly, plus many cross references. I promise you. And the police reported this word to the magistrates. And they were afraid, rightly so, they were afraid. When they heard that they were Roman citizens, don't do that, you're in trouble. And I don't want to get into the detail of the law when people do things like that in those times. You learn a little bit of the law that the jailer, if the jailer let or mishandle that the prisoner escaped, you pay for it. Those kind of stuff. It's even worse now. <clears throat> so they came and apologized to them. They did. That means this, this is serious. We got to get this done quickly before things escalate to the higher echelon. So they came and apolog apologized to them. And they took them, they yanked them, took them out quickly, fast, guy, right? get it done. And ask them to leave the city. Please leave our city. Verse 40, as important as everywhere else, especially to the context of our passage here and to the wondering question. So they went out. Paul and Silas and his companies, his colleagues and his team went out of the prison and and that's in Greek, chi mean connection, complete, together. And as a group, you go, to, for example, you go to in English and it doesn't say much. If you go to the grocery store, you buy this um, apple and banana and pear, okay? And then you buy toilet paper and hand soaps and so on. The, the end 
that group things together and that ends that don't that doesn't group the food and the chemical or supplies are two different ends. This end is a grouping thing together from what had happened to the what follow. They left, they went out from the prison and visited. They went out and visited. Lydia, you remember Lydia, a rich merchant who had a business selling exotic, expensive garment or cloth. It was more expensive than silk. Those for emperors, for royals, and for noble, for rich, wealthy people who has high rank in society. That's her. And she remember where she came from. She came from where Paul came from, Antioch, and so not Paul came from. Paul was ministering to those people, and she had a business here in Philippi. And then she's rich. She was rich, and she started a place to minister to the Jews, God-fearing people. So she feared God. And she became a Christian, and she ministering to the Christian people and missionaries and so on. And Paul went to visit her right away. And it's a grouping concept and items here. And they had seen the brothers. So visit Lydia is to visit the brothers. That means it's a church there. Remember I show you the church in, in Philippi? That's Lydia Church. But I'm sure 2,000 years now, they built over whatever. They encouraged them and departed. All of this, yes, it is scripture, the word of God, historical document. But deep inside of this, we see that a lot of principles and insight and a lot of application that we can learn from. But most importantly, we see our God our Christ, our Lord in it. And this is where Christian grow and take part the divine nature with God in the word of God, in the spirit of God, in a fellowship, in a sermon, in a, in a, in a church. And I hope and pray that this happened here as well. So as I mentioned, our reason, our object today as a Christian to come to church to worship God, of course. And we here to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means to grow in the Bible. So always worship God without growing the word of God. It's empty. Studying the word of God and all of this without worshiping him is futile. So those two are always weekly and daily, personally, corporately. So we are doing that as well. And after that, we learn from this, we go to apply. We find application. Whatever season, whatever holiday or not, we are looking for the path of life so that we can walk. We can live life to honor God, to care for one another, and to represent the gospel in the world. But ultimately, as a Christian, at every given moment to study, to pray, especially, to, I should say, to study the word of God, to study scripture, you should look for the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should look for him. There's something I learned since early stage or age or, yeah, early faith early stage or age of my Christianity, people told me to look for Jesus in a page of scripture. That was something fascinating to me, something that was so impressive and awesome, and I've been practicing that since then. 
So it's important that we are doing that both by the grace of God, by the diligence of our labor in studying the word. Peter wrote this in the very last, last letter, last chapter, and last word. Second Peter 3, 18, he said that, grow in the grace, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in that. And to him, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. This is something, it's a lifelong throughout eternity that we are to grow, we are to give God the glory. Things said and done that we just celebrate, we just celebrate Christmas, we just celebrate the birth of Christ. As I mentioned, we go into, go back into the book of Acts, the missionary journey, second missionary journey, the history of our early church, and all that we just grow, but we never left Christmas. Christmas never really left us. The brightness star of Christ have shown. Although he was born as a baby, he became a human being, perfect human being, and sacrificed on a cross and died there three days and rose again and went back to heaven. His life pre-cross and post-cross is all forever shown. And he gave that light to us because we behold his light. And not just for the Jews, but the Gentiles, not only in Jerusalem and Israel and from the, the Orient and all the way to America. As Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, you saw that. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, a little bit of review of the Christmas celebration and story of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born, who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star, the bright star. This is not a celestial star, this is a star, supernatural star, not supernatural nova, but star that God put there on a very special event moment, one time in human history, because that's only one time that God became man and born as a human once in a human in God history. That star showed once. Although that star was taken away, the glory of that star, the glory of that person stay. And you and I received that gift, that incredible gift, that supernatural gift in our lives. So I want you to understand that this is a very special gift and moment and grace from God to us sinners. One, they saw the star. Two, they have come to worship him. So go along or we go along with this concept of scripture and those men from the ancient time that they had sought God and they had come to worship him. We too, the most important thing, whether this is the end of the year, prepare for new year or not, the new year resolution or not, we are to come to worship God. We come together to worship God and we will be going out from here worshiping God as well. So remember the concept here, he, leave, he left us a supernatural brightness and star, and star and glory and light in each one of us. As you all know, when the Holy Spirit arrived on the day of Pentecost, the same supernatural light came to all believers that day, but us too as well that we receive that supernatural light, the Holy Spirit, in all of our life. Unfortunately, a little footnote here, some of us has dimmed that light and tried to sniff it up, and that is not possible, but that is very sad. The Bible said that we are, some of us try to, to quench, trying to put it out, the Holy Spirit. 
It will not happen. It just make our life uncomfortable and, and very sad. Today's a good reminder, although we take down Christmas light, although we take down the Christmas, the David star, the, 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 the star of the baby Jesus, his star still, still continues to shine. Because it's not just a person, he's not just an important person or human being, he's God. It's just a, a way of review. Let me review, let me bring back two passages that we look at Colossians and Philippians to show the deity of Jesus Christ. I say, I labor as God was incarnate in human flesh. God in a human flesh. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23, our last passage. And I brought this passage to the congregation, to myself, very often. But this time, the season is perfect. I'm going to point out eight times in this short passage that the Bible points out that Jesus Christ is God. Yes, he is the son of God, but he's God. A lot of time, people have a hard time dealing with that. People can maybe push so far to accept that Jesus is the son of God. Catholicism cannot have any art, sculpture, or paints, or, or, or the image of Jesus Christ except a baby Jesus with a little midge, baby have a face of a man, or the one who hung on the cross and died said, for the something I studied that art, but never glorious equal to God. Eastern Orthodox, very much the same and so on. But sadly, some of us who supposed to be educated, the Protestant to study the scripture, to grow in the grace and the knowledge, sadly, some of us still don't understand the quality, the nature, the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us were put out in five seconds by the witnesses of the Mormon when they could not have the door. And we don't know what to say. I'm not talking about a layman Christian. I'm talking about seminary graduate. And can't even deal with that. That is something that for us to grieve. But I do hope and pray that God have grace and mercy on us here as we look at Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 23. Undeniable that Jesus Christ is God. Yes, he is the son of God. Yes, he took form as a human being. That is the second person in the Trinity. But he is still God, equal with God in every aspect. Rank, power, glory, nature, everything. The only 30, around 33 years that he capsulated himself, limited in the human flesh, but still God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 23. I will point out eight times that the Bible, this passage, show that Jesus is divine. Jesus is ultimately the almighty God, equal to the Father. Represent himself as a second person in the Trinity, but also represent God the Father and represent the Trinity as a whole. He is, refer to Jesus. Jesus is the image of of the invisible God. Jesus is a person, it's a contrast, yeah? It's beautiful. This is this is him. This is song. And during those times, Jewish people sing those kind of hymns. If you study music, if you study ancient music, if you study the theology or literature, this is a package of song, second stanza. He is the opposite from this. He and God, image is icon, icon, or icon, icon, we get the word icon. He is the tangible of the object or the person is invisible. Right in the middle, he and God can see, cannot see, but those two the same. I put it, break it down to that formula. 
So in literature and language, he is an image of the unimaged person. That person is God. He is Jesus. He is Jesus of Nazareth. He is equal to God. We can see him because he represents the one that cannot be seen. You cannot be God to represent God. You cannot. You can represent something maybe or, or another, but cannot be represent something who is God, number one, someone or so something that cannot be seen. You have to be so, 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 so powerful. So God yourself. And he is, and he is, he is the image, he is the first one, he is, and all of this go to the subject. He, one singular verb is, the person masculine. He is the image of the inv invisible God. He is a prototokos of all creation. Prototokos, unfortunately, English translate firstborn. Firstborn give a wrong connotation that he is born first. That is, was being born as, of course, they, you can argue, yeah, he wasn't he born, but right here, we are not talking about the birth of Christ. Right here, we talk about the nature of he is. That Jesus, that person who was born, he is the prototakos, mean he is the most preeminent, the most important. Well, we got it. Okay, we understand. Therefore, he's not part of the creation, okay? But there is a message in here clear out that he is the most preeminent, the most important person in all creation. The word creation is the thing that created, whether we see or we don't see, whether material or spirit or angels. Therefore, he has to be above all of them. He has to be the non-created source. He is a non-created. He is a self-created, self-exists, I should say. Therefore, you must be God. And the word all here is to include, to conclude, to collect everything ever exists. Whether beyond our imagination or understanding, beyond eternity, there was infinite, there was infinity, positive and negative, and there's something else beyond that, mathematically paradoxical. Isn't that it is all beyond this? That is in the mind, in the nature of human, in concept of math, in concept of science only. There's a rhyme, there's a rhyme before, above, and after that. Jesus is before all of that. Jesus is more important than all of that. Jesus is stronger than all of, all of that. Why? Because verse 16 explained that. For, because by him, all of that, that he is preeminent before, wait, for by him all, thing, all things were created. This is to say he created all those things. So if he's the one who created everything ever exists, he has to be the creator. So verse 15 say that, verse 16 say that, and then you go to list heaven, earth, visible, invisible, whether the high ring or low ring of all angelic armies, he is above all. So number one, in verse 15, we see all creation. Number two is the second time, all things. Number three, all things were created through him and for him, by him, through him, and for him. By him, talk about his power. By him, he created us. Through him, talk about his connection, his ownership, and lordship, 
and put it this way, he ran a tight ship here. There's nothing go without he noticed. So everything he had to ownership is a power to create and lastly and for him. For him is talk about his his kingship. Everything you have to be offered back to him. So all of this we see that three times already <clears throat> talk about all conclusive totality of everything that point out that Jesus is the no other than the creator of the universe. All things were created through him and for him, verse 17, and he is before all things. Preeminent means the important, the high rank and position, all here in verse 17, talk about timeline. He beyond, he was, he is beyond timeline. Time concept. Number four, in verse 17, time before all things. That is eternal. Earlier, talk about his, his, he is a creator. God to create. Now, he is a God of eternal God. And in him, all things hold together. Number five, in him, all things hold together. We talk about the atom, the neutron, electron, and proton, supposed to burst out and explode it. But because of he, in verse 17 here, Jesus is holding things together, including that little atom. And scientists cannot explain According to scientist calculation, theory, and concept and reality, we are not supposed to be exist. But Jesus, all things holds together. That's number five. So talk about creator, talk about eternal, talk about the sustainer of the universe. Say, oh, God, yeah, somebody believe in God created, but he doesn't care. You walk away, everything a mess. Everything is a mess. It's because of our sin, disobedient. We the one who caused ourselves problem to get so much in debt. He is holding up together, he is fixing up. So we can see that he's not only the creator, he's not only the eternal, he's only sustainer, but the sustainer of the universe. Talk about he is a person who also repair. Redeemer. If we go to <clears throat> verse 18. He's the head of the church. He is the head of the body. And there's a church. He is the owner. He is the superior. He is the king. He's the priest of the church. But say that's the only church. I'm not church. Well, we talk about Thing from 15 to 17, talk about whether you're church people, Christian or not, you belong to him. It's a matter of time that you have to answer to him. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the body, it's, which is a church. He is a beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Talk about preeminent. Talk about the leadership. Talk about the authority of resurrection. He fulfilled the resurrection requirement. He fulfilled the gospel requirement, the redemption plan. He rose from the dead. And this talk about imply that those who follow him, those who trust and believe in him, shall not die even when a body fall to the grave. That in everything, that's number six, everything, he might be preeminent. So he is the savior now. Verse 18, he's a savior. So it's all eight points, but point out to creator, eternal, sustainer, redeemer, savior. Verse 19, for in him all, all again, number seven, the fullness of God 
If that was not enough, it's not clear, verse 19 talk about his ultimate signature, nature, DNA as God. In person, in person. For in him, because all of this has happened from the creator, from the eternal, from the sustainer, from the savior, because all in him, because he is God, put it that way. Number seven in verse 19. <coughs> for because for in him all. All what? Earlier we talked about all creation, all this and all that, all church, all uh, universe. But now talk about the allness, the completeness, the everything of God, all the fullness of God, all the all of God was pleased to dwell. This talk about holy God, holy human, because dwell in what? Dwell in whom? Dwell in the person of Jesus, who was before cross and after cross has a human body. Before cross was perfect, but susceptible to death, but post cross is glorified human Jesus body. So post and pre and post cross, all together, all the nature of God, all the substance and essence and DNA and everything quote unquote material of God, was pleased, was well pleased, was all beautifully, powerfully celebrated in one person to dwell. That, that most important. If you miss anything, don't miss number 19, verse 19. And through him, now go back to because of that, go back to the concept in verse um, just the Redeemer and Savior in verse 18, all of that captured back to highlight who Jesus Christ is after the pinnacle. He is God already and through him to reconcile to himself. Oh, through him, reconcile everything to himself. That means beyond speech. This is almost, if you don't know any better, almost like Jesus taking over God the Father because he reconciled everything to himself. It is, but it's not. The doctrine of reconciliation and through him, it's not like he assigned somebody, he came down to actually do it with sweat and blood, hands and knees. You all know that. Literally hands and knees on the cross through him to reconcile to himself. What did he reconcile? Number eight. Only God can do this. All of this lineup is impossible already unless he's God. But last one, all things. He can save all things and everything as he's pleased and would not drain out his battery. He did not have to recharge that. As much as he push out the energy, the energy is the same, the same. All things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by his blood, human, humanness, his life, sacrificial, perfect lamb of his cross, his cross, his own cross, his own death. This is the one that was born. This is the one that we call Lord. And you were once per alienate, alienate. Alienated, yeah, thank you. <laughs> alienate, alienated and Hostile in mind, thank you. That's my English go. Doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled to his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless. See, this is where we're talking about. 
He's the glorious star. He left, he done his job. We carry this on. Yes, thank you. Blameless and above reproach. The word above reproach here is an important word to answer to what Paul is doing after he was let go for free. Above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which have been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a sinner, became a minister. This is what we are studying, believing, and hold on to our faith, unless we believe in vain. So God did everything, and God bestow upon us not only salvation, but his own personal nature and glory. Make sure you mute. And we know that this is to follow, this is verse 15 of chapter one. Therefore, there's 14 verses before that. First 14 verses before that, one through 14, you see that, talk about our faith, our salvation created through faith and our love for the same and our hope of, of in the scripture of in heaven and believe in the word of truth, the gospel. And we are to bear fruit. To bear fruit is to represent God. To bear fruit is to be above reproach. What is so being above reproach when they let you leave and Paul, you complain, or you say, "Why wow, you come and 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 publicly take me out?" It didn't sound too cool, but watch, follow this. We bear fruit. Since the day have you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, we bear fruit. We increase our fruit. A lifestyle. And verse 8, your love, your love in the spirit. Be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. This is a command from Paul to all Christians. Imagine Paul himself who filled with the spirit of God, the knowledge of God, all spiritual wisdom and understanding to make decisions, especially recorded in the Bible like that. It has to be a good reason. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being, being strengthened with all power according to his, listen, glorious might. The highlight word was a star, now connected to his glorious might. The beauty of not aesthetic only. Glorious or glory is aesthetic and beautiful, but also the glory of a power, powerful person or a power being. For all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Glorious light. Okay. And early we saw his star we come to worship him. He has delivered us from the domain, the control of darkness. That's a contrast again. He, God, Jesus, Deliver us from the domain, the control of darkness, and transfer, connect with that, transfer, transfer us to the kingdom. Instead of domain control, gangster type of mafia type, but kingdom, under the king, benevolent king, rule and order and peace of his beloved son. 
God and Jesus co-labor to deliver us from the domain of darkness to put in the kingdom that beautiful, that orderly, that structural and light and safe and peace. In whom? His beloved son, in whom we have redemption the for and that redemption, the forg forgiveness of our sin. This is where we are Christian are to do, to be, to live our life. The term is the glory of, of God the Father, the glorious might, and the kingdom, the light of the kingdom versus darkness, our own lifestyle and sin. Philippians is the same thing, two, one through 18. We're talking about Jesus left the heaven throne and come and die and now go back, win back to heaven. And verse nine, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestow upon him, on him, the name that is above every name. So that at that name of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every in heaven and on earth and under the earth. It means that even we who, people who reject Jesus as savior and go to the house still have to give him the glory, bow their knees and every tongue shall confess Jesus is Lord, master. But the beautiful harmony of the Trinity, Jesus and God never fight for glory because Jesus did all of this, received all his glory to be glorified by every being, heaven, earth, and, and under the earth. That means he's God. All of this to the glory of God the Father. One, we talk about the, the unity and harmony of, G, of the Trinity. Two, we talk about when we look into this relationship, in this kingdomship, in this culture, we see glory. So again and again, we are to carry the baton of this glory, the light of Christ. And we see that, we jump to verse 16. You shine as light in the world. The result is God well pleased to save you, to appoint you, to empower you, to bless you, to send you out as lights in the world. Christmas lights gone. We take down decoration and lights and all of that, but the real Christmas light of Jesus live on in you because you are the girl in the world to carry this Christmas carols. The light of Christ, the light of God, the glory of the Father. Matthew 5, 14, talk about you are the light of the world. Matthew, the same Matthew, but jump to two verses, earlier 14 or 16. Let your light, let your light shine before others, before men, before people, before the world, so that they may see your good work. It's about your light, your good work, your good works, but the result so that they can give glory, light, beauty, shine, honor to the Father who is in heaven. So every aspect of light, every decision, major decision, especially, especially if you are a seasoned or mature Christian or leader or apostle Paul, you are to live your light, your glorious light in the world. Paul must have done that, except to our limited understanding, it seems like he was being a Karen. I don't know, not guy in God, not God. You come in, take me out. Tell your police to tell the boss to come and take me out. Sounds like that, but no, Paul was not that. The power of the grace of God enable us believers to live like Paul, to do everything and specifically, strategically, wisely glorify God, defend the faith, and give them the gospel. 
all do that. Yes, all did that. He gave God the glory. He defended Christian faith and practice. He defended the church of God. He defended the gospel. He did not let them destroy. But as you observe all of this connection, this cross preferences and the context of the passage, Paul did not live a selfless life. No retaliation, no vengeance at all. He just wanted to, we just want to do things right. He, he wanted to get it right for a reason. Because we see the connection from 37 to 40. He selfishly with the foreigner, with the stranger, with the opponent, but he focused on the gospel and the glory of God and the believer. And thirdly, he continued to preach the gospel. Watch out. Look at that. We remember, go back to our, our, our text, but this is earlier. This is in a portion of 16 to 24. Remember how they mistreat him, them? Verse 19, after they accused them, they dragged them to, into the marketplace. It's not an over. They took him to the marketplace publicly to humiliate this Paul, this Christian representative, the ambassador, the gospel bearer. In a public, Christians are annoying. They make people think Christian are bad people. Paul concerned about that in the marketplace. And not only in the marketplace, one, they escalated to the magistrates, a group of leaders in that society. If that number two is not enough, they bring it to the point of bring their city. They said, these men are Jews and they are disgusting, or necessarily they're disturbing our city. From a little marketplace to the leader of the society and now to the whole city. They gain population, they propagate that idea that these people are bad. They're gonna stop not only Paul, but also Christianity, basically. And not only number three city, they go to all the way to the custom. Oh, they, oh, they advocate something that affect our custom. Our custom cannot take this, and they try to attack us. Number four, the custom, our culture is not enough. They all attack our Romans empire. Oh, become national now. And then all those one, two, three, four, five points that they escalate, now the crowd join what they did was. And then the magistrate decide accordingly to the mob mentality and told the jailer to lock them up. So they were publicly humiliate, not the big deal, as a big deal, but not as a big deal as the name of God, the name of Jesus, the name of the gospel, the name of the Christianity is being put down and named as something evil in their society. But Paul did not retaliate. We saw how he dealt with it. You know, in verse 25, it's no hostile, no evil, no retaliation, but pray to God, honor God, sing, sing praise even in the middle of the night. And of course, we saw the result. God came in to help rescue them using earthquake and the supernatural power of God went through by the physical phenomena to the spirit of the apostle, calm, praying to God and did not do anything evil that one the lost soul. So, in conclusion, when they let Paul go, they told the son a message in verse 37, Paul said, no, I'm not going to do that. Because I'm a uh, uh, U.S. citizen. I'm a, a Roman citizen. 
No, let them come themselves and take me out, take us out. I want my name, I want our name, I want our mission, I want our God, our religion, our doctrine to be clear publicly. Why? How do I know that? Uh, Paul didn't have, uh, you know, a little bit of just poke, uh, you know, putting you in. No, it's nothing compared to God beaten up by those people, humiliated in a whole town. It's nothing like that at all. After all, remember, if you understand the background, you understand the law. Paul was a, a Roman citizen and Silas also. They could have retaliated and taken, taken to court. They could have taken them to court and sued them. Sue them big time and punish them, but Paul didn't do that. Therefore, this is not for a selfish reason, just to clear the name of the gospel, clear the name of Christian missionary, clear Christianity, clear God's name. We are not evil. You guys messed up. And look, I could have sued you, but I did not. How do I know? Paul said all of that because, verse 40, so when they went out from the prison, immediately connect with, they go to the court, they find a lawyer and insurance and accident insurance and so them. No, they went to church. They went to their own people. They went to Lydia. They went to the brothers in the faith. They went to a church in, in Philippi to do what? To complain, poor me, I'm a little, I'm a little sick. Feel me, I need drink a lot. Oh, I need a ball. Oh, ouchie. No, they win and they encourage the brothers. You see that? Number one, verse thirty-seven, connect to forty. They clear the name of God. No retaliation. Number two, they rush to be with their own people. Are you this day rushed to be with your own people? You say, yes, I am. Yeah, it's depending on what define your own people. Your own people here in this definition, Paul went to church. Especially during this holiday, during the holiday season, during the all this cultural thing. We, I'm not blaming, I'm not, I'm not putting anybody down. We naturally drawn to rush to get out from a quote unquote little prison, whatever it is, work or not, to go to our own people. And our own people could be very, very, very scary if you define according to what the Bible say here. However, Paul here went to his own people, his brothers, he went to Lydia's, his sister, and the brothers in the Lord. It's a church there, number two. That means no fighting with people. Put that aside. Close up that chapter. Move forward. Encourage. Do something more positive. We'll talk about New Year resolution. Look at this. Close up the old chapter. Close up. Forget the past. Wrap it up and move forward. Move forward. Focus on the right direction, the right object. If you're the right subject, you, you focus on the right object. To whom you are rushing to minister, to be with, to join, to celebrate. Lydia and the brothers. Number three, what do you do there? You encourage them. You bless them. You give them comfort, joy, celebration, hope. As we saw all of that, hope in heaven, the joys on earth, the mission, number four, and departed. Two words. Actually, one word after and. All of them list, number one, they want to make clear the name of God, Christianity, the gospel. Number two, number two, they had no evil. <clears throat> they had no evil. 
They have no retaliation. They do not turn evil to evil. I'm sure they pray for them. I'm sure they gave them the gospel. Number three, they rush to be with their own people. Number four, they build one another up. I'm sure people say, Paul, you look like a mess. He said, don't worry about it. The small thing. I'm worried about you. I need to encourage you. But your face, like, I can't recognize your face. is like swollen like a balloon. I'm sure Paul could have easily done this. Okay? You want to see I'm better? Because he has supernatural power. He can do that. He can heal. He can heal. He can raise a person from the dead. But Paul, I'm sure he didn't do any of that. Because when Timothy, his beloved son, have stomach ulcer issue, he said, take some probiotic and go to sleep. Stop whining. Be strong. Stop complaining. You know who you are? That's why you did. So do something. Stop complaining. Encourage people, build people up. Fifthly, he departed. If you understand the word departed here, just take off. It's not cold hearted, it's disconnect, and it's not jet lag in Cambodia. No, not at all, because the way he rushed to be with them, the way he comforted them is loving, but he had a mission to accomplish his purpose in life. He wrap around concern about all the lost soul in which when we close up chapter 16, guess what next? Yes, you guessed it. chapter 17. <laughs> Good job. Wow, seriously. 17, we're going to open up to Thessalonica, open up to, to Ephesus, go open up to deeper in Europe. And all the way from here on downward to the point of Paul was arrested and from Jerusalem all the way to shipwreck and all the way to Rome and lay his head on a block and chop it off in the end of Paul's life. And that's sad, humanly speaking, very sad. I almost, I, I, no, not almost, every time I confess, I cannot to think. I, I have a feeling because of immaturity. I feel like that's not right. That's not fair. I, I it is it is a little tiny Spartan in me want to fight them that kill our apostle Paul. Spartan fight with the Rome, but I'm nowhere close to Spartan. By the way, sad, sad. And number two, the book of Acts seems to end abruptly as we enjoy starting the history, everything about the early church development. Anyway, after 16, Acts 16, we're going to see the strong, full-blown development of the missionary work of Paul. We see all the church in, in Europe that we know, Thessalonica, Oak, oh, the Corinth, Corinthian church, the Fishing church, Ephesian church, and all of that, and plus other churches that were not named in the Bible as a book. But Paul went all that right after this. He departed because he knew in his spirit, the spirit of God spoke and led him, and he knew it as well. He needs to go because he knew that his days are counted. He said, the sun was set on him. The winter will come, was will will land on him soon. Bring me the cloak. Bring me the parchment. I'm cold. Come soon before winter. He knew that he will die. He said all along, for me, it's not a problem. It's a benefit. But for me to stay a little bit for your benefit. If I have to choose, it's hard to choose, but I choose ever. So he departed. The word departed here carry pregnant with powerful, beautiful, important point that he depart so that he can start the missionary work in a full speed. He departed from here, he on his way to death. 
tortured, shipwrecked, beaten, and ultimately executed and murdered. So what we say as we close it, we say, sad? Or we say, excited? It's up to your perspective, your conscience, your spirit, your nature. I hope, knowing that you cannot escape 17, 18, all the way to the end, you know what the end means. The attitude, the spirit, the walk, the journey that you take could be glorious for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the power and glory of our Lord God the Father. And Paul departed with such spirit. Can you imagine the New Year resolution to get off of the last word, word here departed and open up the next chapter 17? And you'll be surprised how rapid, how fast, how powerful it goes. 2024 is coming very quickly. And I am not a person who culturally, I don't disagree with that or anything, but I prefer to go bigger and stronger and more eternal, more stable and more powerful in the word of God that God gave you. The nature, the power, the grace to depart from this 2023 to go to 2024 as Paul, the beloved servant of God, who crowned evaded him in heaven, take off, quote unquote, a new year's start tomorrow. I hope your life, your soul, your heart knitted to this type of encouragement and teaching, as Paul did, scripture does, the Holy Spirit does to all of us. Therefore, at this point, as we're counting down, I wish you all Happy New Year.